Wow. She said my whole name. You know you're special when somebody says your whole name. She forgot singing, but I'm going to let her slide on that one. And you know, and, and I got promoted. I'm not just a, uh, uh, a friend. I'm a son now. Hallelujah. So I can expect some big birthday presents, right, Pastor Elliot? Right, Mom? Hallelujah. God's an awesome God, amen? Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. We need you. We don't need opinion. We don't need hype. We need you. Lord, speak to our hearts today. God, encourage our hearts today, God. Motivate us, God. God, allow this word, God, to take us from where we are to where you need us to be. We bind every distraction. God, give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. In Jesus' name. Everyone say? Amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a praise. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many first time visitors do we have here today? This is your very first time here. Raise your hand high. Raise your hand high. I'm sorry? I know, you know, I was looking at you the whole time. I'm like, you know, you hate to stare at people. You know, that's kind of rude. But I'm staring, I'm like, hmm. I know that, fa I know that face. Come on, stand, stand up, stand up. Come on, let's put our hands together. She come, <laughs> she from way back. Way, way, way back. It's a blessing to see you in the house this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know what? Who? Uh, you look quite elegant today, Jada. Can you come here, please? With your elegant self. Could you give those to Patrice right there? And... Hallelujah. That's from the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Vanna. Your, your job ain't done yet. There's a young lady right there. Yes, he, where, where are you hand with the glittering face mask on. Yeah, that's all right there. Hallelujah. Come, let's put our hands together for our visitors. Hallelujah. How did you hear about us? Oh. Okay. Oh, come on, let's put our hands together. She could have went anywhere. She ain't had to come here. How many people are excited today? Hallelujah. Now, if some of y'all facial expression match that, we'll be working with something. Because some of y'all looking mad. And come on now. Hallelujah. It's a blessing to see Amanda's father in the house this morning. Yeah. Excuse me? Oh, today's his birthday. Uh, he said, no. Uh, well, I will. Come on, let's put our hands together for him one more time. Yeah, if y'all ain't recognize, I ain't going nowhere, no time soon. Amen? Amen? Death has visited my house several times and have left disappointed. 
Somebody say amen to that. But God, I'm excited. I'm excited because I have breath to breathe. Amen. I ain't nobody rolled me in here. I walked in here on my own. I ain't in some hospital with a bunch of tubes hooked up to me. Let me tell you why I'm saying that. Because there was a time when that was a regular occurrence for me. There was a, there was a period of time where almost every month or every other month, I was in the hospital for something. Either getting something put in or something taken out. Yes. But God has graced my life to be able to stand here. Hallelujah. And um, it's, 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 it's not till September, but I, I like to celebrate this yeah, as much as I can. In September, I'll be saved 32 years. Now, I, I understand that's longer than most of some of y'all been alive. Amen? But I thank God for it. God just saw me through some insane stuff, some of my own stupidity. Hallelujah. Jay, can you fix um, um, Mother and her granddaughter's picture right there? Oh, it's all, it all fell over? Lord, in the name of Jesus, no. Just hope, yeah, Oprah's like that. There, yeah, there we go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can't have her falling. And it's a blessing to see Mother Diana in the house. Yeah, let her know we miss her. Amen. She had a, 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 a foot situation. Amen. Listen, whenever you're on the front lines doing anything for God, just be prepared for the enemy to come for you. I know I'm going to get a whole bunch of amens on that. Don't nobody want to say amen to that. Amen. Everybody want to be you, but don't nobody want to be attacked. Everybody want to, want to be on the stage, but don't, no, don't want what comes along with that. This looks, this looks nice and, and glitzy and glamorous, but there's some stuff that comes with this. Somebody say amen. It, it, it's like you trying to play football but don't want to get hit. You're going to get hit. That's part of the game. Amen? So part of being used by God is the devil coming at you. But here's the good part about that. God got your back. So if the devil comes at you, he ain't fighting you. He fighting him. Y'all ain't, y'all, y'all, y'all missed that one. See, it'd be one thing if the devil was coming after you, fighting you. Then you have a problem. But if the devil's coming after you, but fighting your God, you ain't got no problem. Why? Because your God is the one that fights the battle. Do, we, do I have anybody in here that God has fought a battle for them? I, I can't hear you. Do I have anybody? God fights for his people. Always, always know that. Never doubt that. God fights for his people. I would not be working for God for 32 years if he ain't fought for me. I'd have quit a long time ago. Okay. You think, what? <laughs> okay. This, this, is, this is no joke. This is nothing to play around with. You know what I'm saying? But it's worth doing. There's no other God worth serving. No other God can give you what Jesus can give you. No other God can do for you what he can do for you. Ain't no man, woman alive. Ain't nobody hips that good. Okay. Somebody say amen to that. I'm excited because our, our, our boys are going to be going. Uh, I, I, I would have thought I would have heard a whole bunch of mothers shouting and clapping and <laughs> carrying on. But I can tell you this, and I don't guarantee a whole lot of stuff. I will guarantee this. Your boys will come back different. They will come back different. God ain't setting this up. God is not setting this up for them to come back the same. Oh, they will come back different. So much so, you know, like, who child is you? Who are you? Because you? you're not like my, no, this is not my son. 
No, it's the better version. Amen? How many of you have been watching the world games? Okay, three people. Hallelujah. Well, we should be excited, amen. Our, our, bishop, our bishop is Bahamian by birth, amen? Okay, two people clap, hallelujah. <laughs> but a young lady, a young lady from the Bahamas just won. She's just become the world champion in the 400. This is the first time a Bahamian had won the 400. First time. And not only did she win, she blew people away when she won. It wasn't, it wasn't even like it was like to the line, you know, it was close. It wasn't even close. She had like five to ten yards on the person in second place. So God, amen, we should celebrate that. Amen. Not only that, a young, young lady named Sydney McLaughlin, she won the, world, she won the, the 200 meter hurdle. And she, she broke her world record and set a new one. And, let me, and when they interviewed her, this is what she said. She said, first of all, I want to give all glory to, to Jesus. And then she, she proceeded to quote a scripture. And then after she quoted the scripture, she said, I want to give God all the glory. How many of you know that's why she broke the world record? Bishop says this all the time. When God gives you a platform, he don't give you a platform for you. That platform has nothing to do with you. You are nothing but an advertisement for heaven. You are there to get, you live to allow Christ to shine, not you. So when God puts you on a platform like that, God puts you on a platform like that so he can receive the glory. The Bible says if I be lifted up, I, be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So how is God to be lifted up? Through us. Somebody say amen. amen. That's why we should, we should get behind someone who's in the church, who's doing the work of the Lord, but maybe running track. Uh, like Jonathan Isaac, playing basketball. Amen. The NBA, the platform God has given them. We need to get behind that. Why? Because that's giving God glory. Amen. You don't want to do anything that brings you glory. Yeah, I ain't no, I ain't no get home. Yeah, I ain't no get home much of amens on that because some of us want to do stuff that bring us glory. Okay, I know you ain't no admit to that, but that's okay. I can admit for you. But you want to do something that brings God glory, that makes Him smile. Amen. Somebody say amen to that. Y'all ready to do some work today? Uh oh, uh oh. Well, we we don't go to work today. Amen. It's, it's, it's going to be a good day at work. Hallelujah. It's going to be, I, you know, I was, I was in the lab for most, um, early this morning. Uh, and when I say the lab, I'm talking about my prayer closet. You know, I go, you know, you know, when you go in the lab, you go in the lab to work. That's where I go. Amen. And I was praying for a word. Make sure I had the right word. Because you don't, you don't, you never want to preach out of your circumstances and it doesn't apply to the people and it can't bless somebody amen because some some stuff god takes you through and some revelations god shows you are for you and nobody else and then there's some revelations god shows you that are for everybody else and you oh you're never excluded listen if you share anything it's for you first and then the people next amen but the, I believe the Lord has given me a word this morning that um, it's going to set you free if you let it. How many people want to be set free? Let me ask you a question. How many people want lower gas prices? Raise your hand if you want. Matter of fact, stand on your feet if you want lower gas prices. Okay, the people who standing don't drive nothing. I understand. <laughs> Junior, well, no, don't don't sit down. Yeah, sit down, stand up. 
people who sitting down, you ain't got no car, so you ain't, you don't care nothing about gas. You ain't got to pay nothing. You riding. But I, if I was you, I would stand because somebody who is paying gas got to give you a ride. So you should want lower gas prices too. That's more rides for you. Okay, now we got that. Sit down. We're going to do some exercises in the morning. If I, if I showed up, we're we going to do exercises. So I saw how many people stood up when they want lower gas prices. How many people want God to be glorified in their lives? Stand up. Oh, okay, the hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together. Okay, now we, we, got that, we got that understanding. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I had to do that little exercise. I had to know what church I was in. The front may say Jump Ministries Global Church, but sometimes we be, um, hmm. Yeah, yeah, we'd be on something we'd be on something different. <laughs> Amen. How many people ever woke up? You when you opened your eyes, you were in a good mood. But by the time you left your house, something had happened. And you don't know you, you were in a good mood, but now you are somewhere, uh. And by the time you get into your car or get to work or where you're going, that done went down a couple. So not only are you not uh -uh anymore, I wish somebody would say something to me. I, I, please look at me wrong. Please. Anybody ever got, been like that before? That's called life. Life happens, amen? You, well, you ain't lying. Life happened to me this week. As a matter of fact, I was on my way to work. Um, I was working um, for a company that or providing like low, see if we could get your bill lower if you had Spectrum. And um, you, know, you know those people that are in Walmart by the electronic um, department asking you who you have for internet or who you have for cable? Raise your hand if you ever seen those people. Yeah, I was one of those people. I used to avoid those people. I became one of them. <laughs> yeah. I'd laugh the whole time. I'm like, I would tell a coworker, I used to be, I, I used to avoid me. And now I am that person. Well, on my way to a particular Walmart, I'm going down to 408, and my car starts smoking. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, what, what is this? It's, you ain't supposed to be smoking. Come to find out my serpentine belt just pew, popped. And anybody who knows even a minimal about cars, if your serpentine belt comes off, your car ain't going nowhere. It stops immediately. And not only did it stop immediately, somehow it caused the oil to shoot all over my engine. And I'm stuck coming off the 408, looking right at Colonial, and get and let me and guess how hard it was. And I looked at the temperature of my car, it said 100 something. I said, Jesus, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. Now, normally, I would be in a very unchristian like mood. There'll be no thank you, Jesus, no praise the Lord coming out of my mouth, normally. Amen. Uh, okay, and maybe that's just me. Y'all just so sweetly saved that when something go wrong, y'all just shouting hallelujah. Okay. But and, and automatically, I said, God, I give you praise. God, I praise you for this too. And I see, that's how you know you changed. You don't know you changed when you're on the mountain. You know you've changed when you're in the valley. Because if your response in the valley looks like your response should be on the mountain, that means you changed. But if you on a mountain and have a valid experience and that's where your reaction is, you, come on, because that's where you need to be. That means the change has not happened. We were faking. 
And in this time, we can't afford to fake. So I'm sitting there. I said, Lord, thank you. And God taught me. And all this time, God taught me a, a, a new, you know, God never ceased to amaze me. If you've known God for any, any amount of time, you really know him, he amazes you every day. God blows my mind every day. I never get used to a revelation. I never get used to God doing something. I, I, I'm blown away every time he does it. So when he did that, I said, God, thank you. And God taught me that we need to develop a that too praise. God, I praise you for that too. Even, God, if, if, if you lose your job, God, I praise you for that too. God, my body's not feeling right. God, I praise you for that too. Now, that seems crazy. Why would you praise God for your body not acting right or you losing a job? Why? Because he's still God. He didn't stop being God when you lost a job. He didn't stop being God when you got sick. He didn't stop being God when they left you and, and, and walked out of your life. He was still God. He's God when stuff is good. He's God when stuff is bad. He's God when everything is working, and he's God when nothing at all is working. And we need to develop a praise that lets God know, God, I understand that you're God no matter if good stuff happens or bad stuff happens. Good or bad doesn't change who you are. So my praise should reflect who you are. Because it could be my praise that someone sees or hears that can change their mind or change their attitude. Uh, see, when you praise God, you ain't, just, you ain't even praising God for you. You praising God for somebody else. So when stuff happens to you, listen, let me tell you, uh, Terrible stuff happens every day. Terrible things happen to good people. And I use that term loosely because ain't none of us good. We want to be good. We would love to believe that stuff we do is good. And if you leave us long enough with our own, you know, thoughts, we'll tell you everything is good. But ain't nothing good in us but Christ. Okay, say, uh, say this with me. Say, there's nothing good in me but Jesus. Yeah, yeah, let that marinate for a second. Say it again. There's nothing in me that is good but Jesus. That'll save your life. That'll keep you out of some stuff. Amen? So, you know, I had, I had an interesting week. I had a, a very interesting week. So, um... Hallelujah. I don't know how many weeks I've had that wasn't interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 20. When you have it, say amen. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry. That's not 1st, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, what, Monica, why you said that? I heard that. <laughs> Monica, hmm. Get it right, preacher. Hmm. Where you going? Yeah, I, okay, I got you. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. I just done the same thing, too. Hallelujah. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 20. It says, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us in giving us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I got a lot of problems. But my promise is greater than my problems. And I'm going to speak to you this morning from the topic, my promise is greater than my problems. We got problems, amen? And I, I thought this was interesting. Listen to this. It says, due to COVID-19, 53% of Americans 
claimed that their mental health had been negativity, neg neg negatively affected. So they're saying because of COVID-19, their mental health has been affected negatively. These gas prices are affecting my mental health. <laughs> ain't got nothing to do with COVID. None at all. Our wages are not going up, but the prices are. Not only are we worried about that, we're worried about the safety of our children. You don't, you, you don't even know if you should let your children go to school. You don't know, you pray, God protect them, but when they walk out, they walk back in. Because there's been several parents, there's been parents over time where their children left to go to school and never came back. Some, some person so with some spirit in them, so the demonic possession, decided I want to shoot up the school. Or I want to shoot up where they at. Not only that, some of us go to work and pray, God, let me make it back home. You don't know what crazy person out there on the road ain't paying attention. You don't know when you get to work. You ever heard that term going postal? How many people have ever heard that term? Well, that come from a real place. There was a, uh, some years ago, a lady walked into a, a postal center where she used to work and killed several people. And they don't understand. And they were like, well, why she do that? The stress of everyday life the stress of what's going on in America, what's going on in the world, is causing people to maximize their problems over God's promise. And it causes them, especially the children of God, the church, who's supposed to be the one cheerleading and promoting God's promises, we're the ones looking at our problems the hardest. And saying, God, where, where are you? We, we begin to sound like the children of Israel when they were in the uh, wilderness. God, how you take us out of Egypt? At least, God, at least in Egypt, we had something to eat. At least in Egypt, God, we had some uh, stability. God, at least in Egypt, we knew what was going to happen. But God, now you break us out of Egypt into this wilderness, and you call this deliverance? God, this does not look that like deliverance. But you know, that, that, that begs the question. What does deliverance really look like? Who are we to decide what deliverance looks like? Who are we to decide when God shows up and when he doesn't? Who are we to decide what is God and what isn't? See, sometimes when you go through so much stuff, it will cloud your judgment and, 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 and trick your eyes or alter your thinking into thinking God is not with you and God is not for you. But God is not the type of God that attaches himself to you and then leaves you high and dry. And you have to understand that God's promises are much greater than your problems. Why? Because God's promises are eternal. Your problems are temporal. Your problems come and go. God's promises will be there now, tomorrow, and the day after. So we have to understand that God's promises are greater than our problems. And we have to look to God. We have to give God praise no matter what. We can't get caught up in the stuff that's going on. We can't get, up, get caught up and get sidetracked and get distracted in what's going on in our life and cause us to miss God's hand and miss what God is doing. And when you are not focused on God's promises or God's word, your direction goes up. You can miss, you can make your exit. Anybody here ever been driving somewhere and you don't know where you're going and you mess around and miss your exit? And it's not like you can just catch the very next one. Because sometimes if you miss your exit, the next one, the next exit you see, it says exit only. That means you cannot get back on the highway, highway at that point. That means you got to go down further, way out of your way, to get back to your destination. So we cannot, afford, we cannot afford to miss our exit. So we cannot afford to get caught up and distracted in the day-to-day -day problems. Because everybody's going to have day-to-day -day problems. Everybody, stuff is going to go wrong. As a matter of fact, stuff that you don't want to go wrong will go wrong. People will go wrong. Okay. Some of you know, some of you may not know, I, um, I used to be married. 
Y'all got real quiet right there. Yes, I used to be married. Now I'm not married anymore. I am single. Hallelujah. And I never look better. Hallelujah. I, I just don't throw that out there. But my marriage went wrong. Hallelujah. And one of the two participants in the marriage began to focus more on the problems than the promise. And it caused them to make decisions that they felt was in their best interest. And that's what happens when you begin to focus more on the problems than the promise. You start making decisions that are in your best interest and not God's. Now, when you got saved, you signed up to say, God, is your will, not my will. God is your way, not my way. But in the, in, in the process of life, things happen. And if you don't concentrate on God's promise rather than your problems, you'll start saying, you know what? Uh, this is not working out for me. This is not serving my interest. So I need to take care of me. Now, that's funny because um, when you got saved, who, who you, who's taking care of you? You didn't save you. You didn't deliver you. You sure enough didn't heal you. Oh, so now you got to look out for you? See, that's the danger of focusing on the problems rather than the promise. Because you start making decisions and, and start, start, start taking on roles that you don't have the power to uphold. You cannot keep you. How many people in this room can keep themselves? Raise your hand. Because y'all looking at me like I got five heads. That's all right. I come to work this morning. How many people can keep yourself? We say that now because we're in church. But how many, how many people are saying that same thing when you out there in the midst of whatever you're going through? See, it's hard to, pra it's hard to praise God when there ain't nothing around you to praise God for. It was very difficult for me to praise God sitting up in a truck in 100 degree weather broke down the side of the road. That is not an easy atmosphere. You ain't up there singing and dancing to, oh, what a mighty God. I certainly ain't nobody doing that. But when your promise is real and your praise is as real as your promise, that when adversity happens, you will do the opposite of what people expect. People expect you to complain, you begin to praise. And people look at you like, what are you praising God for? Because he's good. How is God good? I ain't dead. And if this car is broken, it can be fixed. Whatever it's, it causes you to see, it causes your perspective to be right. And that is why we got to keep our eyes on Christ. That's why we got to keep our, our head, our, 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 our stuff at the, at the altar. We got to stay at the altar. Why? Because this world, everything that's going on, the spirit that's over this world can mess up your perspective and have you thinking wrong, have you seeing wrong, have you talking wrong, and have you hearing wrong. And then we'll begin to connect ourselves to the wrong people. Who can't do anything to benefit us and won't do anything to get us to where God wants us to go. And as, and as soon as we have outlived our usefulness to them, they will drop us high and dry just like they found us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at, go, go with me to 2 uh, Kings. 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6. There's two kinds of problems that we deal with. We deal with external problems and we deal with internal problems. Sometimes those internal, sometimes those external problems can be like, oh my God. But they're a little easier to deal with because they're external. It's some internal problems we need to watch. Now look at this. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. Is this helping anybody today? It says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. 
And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the, the Syrians are come down. How I many know God will have your back? When the devil plotting, God got your back. See, don't worry about what people say or what people do, or you feel like people working against you and plotting against you. Don't worry about that. Because if you in God's hand, God fighting that battle. You ain't got to fight that, but you ain't got to cuss them out. You ain't got to look funny at them. I'm going to back up. You ain't got to cuss them out. One more time. You ain't got to cuss them out. Because we got some cusses up in here. I ain't going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm just going to trust that you understand I know who you are. Because everybody is in the process. Everybody is sweetly saved. Amen? We got some cussers. We got some cutters. We got some um, swingers. When I say swinger, do you swing on anybody? Okay. We got some holy thugs. Yeah, I know I am. And the king of, in verse 10, and the king of Syria, and the king of Israel, excuse me, sent to the place which the man of God had told him and warned, warned, warned him, warned him of, and saved himself there, not once, but twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was so troubled for, the, for this thing. And he said to his servants, he called to his servants and said to them, will ye not show me which one of us it's for the king of Israel. He said, wait a minute, who are y which one are y'all telling our business? Because how is he knowing where we about to set him up at? How does he know which way we coming? How does he know where the trap was? Which one of you are spilling the beans? I want to know, because there's nowhere in the world he should know where the setup is. But see, what the king of Syria didn't understand is that there was a God that was behind Israel that would not let Israel get caught up or set up. And that, that I, want, I want to bring that to today, so I'm bringing that right now. There's a God behind you that no matter what the enemy tries, no matter who he uses, no matter what they do, no matter what kind of plans they devise, that you are protected. Why? Because you got a God behind you. Devil can set up all he want to set up. I'm still don't come out on top. Yeah, I may have. I, yeah, I, yeah, I may. There may be setbacks. Yes, you don't have setbacks. But every setback is not a failure. Every setback is not a defeat. And if we learn from our setbacks, they can be beneficial. I'm gonna touch that in a minute. Just hold there. And one of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, go, spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And, 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 and it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he threw the horses and chariots and a great host. And there and they came by night and compassed the city. But when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host com com compassed, about, compassed the city, both horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, master, how shall we do? I'd have fired him. How you with the prophet? And you done seen some of the stuff the prophet done. done. You've seen God move. How you with the prophet? And then when trouble hits, you talk about what we going to do? What we did before. Praise God. We going to keep doing what God told us to do. Amen? I ain't going to stop doing stuff. I ain't going to stop doing what works when trouble hits. So my mama taught me, see, my mama taught me a very valuable lesson, a very important lesson. 
If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If your praise has been working for you this far, why stop? If your God was real then, ain't he still real now? If your God brought you out of that, he can't bring you out of this too? That's a sorry God that can bring you out of that but can't bring you out of this. I don't serve a sorry God. I serve a powerful God. That no matter what the enemy throws at me, no matter what stupidity I get myself into, because you know we do that. Okay, oh, let's park there for a second. Y'all was hoping I was going to gloss over that. No, no. <laughs> See, a lot of stuff that we fight against ain't because the devil did something. A lot of stuff we fight against because we did it. We thought we knew better. We thought we had a handle on everything. You know how them relationships we done got into? Don't, don't duck now. Because they, they, they was everything we wanted. We had a list. Someone still, how many, raise your hand if you got a list. Don't lie. You in the house of God. Yeah, thank you. And some of, some of y'all still, you know, I'm going to pray for y'all deliverance later. Because everybody in here got a list. And every day you leave your house, you looking. Nope. Mm-mm. Nope. And then we find, oh, there you go. The Lord has answered. The Lord ain't answered nothing. That was you answered. <laughs> Jesus ain't had nothing to do with that. That was you and you alone. Now, is it wrong to have what you want uh, that, that, that person to be like? No, it's not wrong. It's not, it's, not, it's not wrong to have a preference. I'm going to need some of y'all not to say amen so loud. I'm going to need a couple of silence amens. You just right, right up in there. Because some of y'all, amen. Y'all were feeling that strong. <laughs> some of y'all, it's not wrong to have a preference. But your preference should not supersede what your God wants for you. See, when your preference supersedes God's plan, that's when we run into problems. That's when we'll start excusing stuff we shouldn't excuse. We'll start overlooking stuff, little, 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 little faults, little personality faults, but like, you know, you know, well, you know, he can change. Mm-mm. So I'm going to be the one to change him. No, you ain't. Because, um, sister girl, let me help you out for a second. There have been those with curvier hips than you that came along and can change them. Yeah, yes. There's been some prettier ones that came along and couldn't do nothing with them. Because you cannot fight a spiritual battle with natural weapons. And what's wrong with him is spiritual. It ain't natural. So you can have all the hips, bust, thighs, tips, all you want to. It ain't going to fix his spirit. It ain't going to fix his soul. Only Jesus can do that. So you might as well reserve your hips and your fingertips for the right one and let Jesus do his job. Amen? Hallelujah. Brothers, talk to me. Okay, don't act, boy, don't. I said, brothers. Oh, no, no, y'all, what happened? <laughs> hey, yo, yeah, yeah, just go ahead and say it. <laughs> I don't care how many, I don't, I don't care how much money you make. I don't care what kind of style you have. I don't care if you just, just refined, you just everything, boom. Only Jesus can keep her. Only Jesus can. If she's drawn to you, what is she drawn to? Is she drawn to the Christ in you? Or your cologne? Or your bank account? Or your car? Or your house? Hallelujah. 
She looked wonderful, but she can't cook. She up there asking you, well, uh, um, um, how you fry eggs? No, 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 you got to go. You got to leave. She can't even boil water. And God forbid you get sick. She ain't calling on Jesus. She calling the doctor. Now, ain't nothing no wrong with calling the doctor, but the doctor should not have been the first call. Jesus should have been the first call. And then you call the doctor. Somebody say amen. amen. So we get ourselves in the situations and get mad at God when those situations fall apart. The situations fell apart because we had our mind on our problem and not God's promise. God promised us a, the right mate, the right one, a help meet. Help meet. That means they help you meet something. They, you know, help you. That means you are doing something for them to help you with. But you ain't doing nothing what they will help you with. They don't help you with nothing. You know that song. Yeah, you know, I ain't got to, I ain't got to recite it for you. You know it. Some of y'all singing it right now. Somebody said, what's this song? Something, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. So we got, we can't get not, we cannot get caught up. And problems. Problems will come. And some problems are devastating. Some problems are life altering. What happened to me was a life al I've had, I don't even, I don't even know how many life altering problems I had. I've had so many that I don't even know if they're not even like big anymore. They're like, okay, this is not another one. Your kidney spell, life altering. Uh, uh, get divorced, life altering. Uh, stuff going wrong in your body, life-altering. I cannot get, if I get caught up in those life-altering problems and forget the promise that God made, those life-altering problems will cause me to do stuff that will, that will negate what God wants to do, that will take me out of position for God's blessing, and when God's blessing comes, it has missed me because I'm not in the right place. That's like me telling you, come to this door and you go to the back door. The gift was at the front door, but you went to the wrong door. Because you were thinking wrong. Your perspective was wrong. Because your eyes were off of the promise and on the problem. And what the devil likes to do, he likes to distract us with the problem that we forget the promise. Because some problems get so big and so loud that God's promise almost seems like a distant memory. It almost becomes like a whisper. And when he was like, God, 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 where are you? God, I thought you don't be here. God, I thought you would protect me. God, I thought you was gonna help me. God, I thought you God says, I am here. What you talking about? You can't hear me? No, they can't hear you. Because they've allowed the problem to be louder than the promise. And I was in I was in danger of that happening to me. And there were times when I let the problem be louder than the promise. And it did not work out. Amen? We cannot do that. We cannot let external problems take us out of God's will. Cause us to get caught up and do some foolishness. That, don't, that not only endangers us, but endangers people connected to us. Somebody say amen. Go with me, go with me to Romans. Romans chapter 7. And Gehazi was looking at all those people. He was looking at that, 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 that army of the Syrians that was surrounding them, and he started freaking out. He said, oh, Lord, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Elisha just simply came out and said, Lord, touch his eyes. Touch it. God, help him. He ain't. Lord, help him. I can imagine Bishop praying that prayer for us a lot. Jesus helped him. He just said, Lord, help him. Lord, where they at? Help him, Jesus. And then when Gehazi opened his eyes again, he saw the host of heaven behind the host that was coming after them. And he began to understand, greater are they that are with us than they that are with them. 
Somebody said, my promise is greater than my problems. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, your promise is greater than your problems. So you need to start acting like it. Yeah, they may get mad at you, but that's all right. Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 14. It says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do allow not, for what I would that I do not, but what I hate that I do. If then I do which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, I, for the good that I would, I do not. And, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Can anybody identify with that one? You don't even need to understand own English to understand what's going on right there. I'm going to break it down to today's uh, understanding. I'm always doing stuff I ain't got no business doing. I'm always into something I ain't got no business in. I'm always drawn to something I ain't got no business to being drawn to. He should not catch my eye. She should not catch my eye. I should not be drawn. Yeah, how many, okay, ladies. How many of y'all like a rough neck? Don't lie now. Do not lie. The, thank you. Hallelujah. The rougher, the better, too. Yeah, okay. I understand. And don't, don't, don't let him have, don't, hey, don't let that grill be shining, too. And he had that, that, that little talk about him. You know the grill, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Monster that, monkey like, I don't do grills. No, mm, that's not me. That's not me. And you know you ain't got no business talking to him. You know you ain't got, and then you find yourself walking past him with, for no reason. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit telling you the whole while, go back, go back, turn around. Mm-mm, this ain't the one, turn back, don't go around. But you've you been, but you've been by yourself so long. That bed been empty for so long. You want that companionship so bad that God can't, you know, just, you know, you know how when you're trying to eat right, you have a cheat day? <laughs> you know how you try to treat that as a spiritual cheat day? Well, God, just let me have this one. I'll go back on the diet tomorrow. No, you won't. And that's how we get ourselves in a mess. Amen. And then we come to church praying, Bishop, you got to help me, Bishop. No, whoa, whoa, whoa. God ain't tell you to do that. See, we, we do it all the time. We try to have somebody rescue us from our own catastrophe. When the Holy Spirit the whole time was telling you, turn around. Don't go that way. Turn around. Uh-uh, that, that ain't the promise. That's not the promise. That's not the promise. That's not the promise. And the big old sirens going off. That's not the promise. I wish I had a bullhorn. I wish I had a bullhorn right now. I know we got one. We got one, don't we? Yeah, I know we do. We got a bullhorn. The Holy Spirit with the boy. That is not the promise. But we're so blinded by the problems. We have been so settled by the problems. The 
problems have become so big, so, so, so like right in your face that you can't see the promise. And the sad things, nine times out of 10, the promise is standing behind the problem. But you can't focus on the promise because you can't see the promise for the problem. But when you begin to focus on God's promises and settle there, God gives you spiritual x-ray vision that you see through the problem to the promise. And although the promise, the problem is in your face, you not move. Why? Because you can see the promise. So your posture demonstrates that you, you have confidence, but the problem thinks you got the confidence in them. Uh-uh. The, problem, the, the, the confidence is in the promise behind the problem. And God is causing me to see past what I'm going through to where, I'm, where he wants me to be and where he's going to take me. So my now attitude, what I'm doing now, dictates what I'm going to be later. My now attitude tells you that the problem is here, but it's not, it's not staying. The, the problem is right now, but it's not eternal. What is eternal is the promise. So now my behavior, my behavior is indicative of the promise, not the problem. So when the devil comes at me and I begin to behave different, he's like, what is wrong with you? I'm looking at the problems. The problem I have to deal with, but I won't let the problem affect me to the point that it takes me out of position for the promise. Not even my, my internal problems. Because if you read in the scripture, he's saying the thing I want, I want to do, I don't do. And the thing I hate, that's the thing I'm doing all the time. It's the thing that gets you to go to every altar call that's, that's, that's presented. It's the thing that, okay, yeah. It's the thing that keeps you at the altar. God, take this thing out of me. God, take this thing out of me. God, take this thing out of me. That's not a bad place to be. That's a place that shows that you're fighting. That's a place that shows that you haven't given up, that you haven't resigned to what the enemy is throwing at you. That's a place that tells you that uh, God is not dead inside of me. I am not giving up on this. Yes, it's rough right now, but it's good. it may be rough right now, but it won't be rough always. Yes, I'm broke right now, but I ain't always be broke. You know, I'm not living where I want to live, but there will be a day that I will be living where I want to live. I will be making what I want to make. I will be married to one. My body will be right. My children. I have not given up on the promise. And let me, let me help you out with something else. The harder the problem, the greater the promise. If you if you dealing with some heavy problems, you got some heavy promises coming. That means that the, the promise God has on your life is a big one. So the enemy has to hit you with something that is it, 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 it matches the, 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 the promise. The enemy can't hit you with something that's lighter than the promise. Because it won't fit you. So he has to match the promise or try to. But he can't match what God can do. No, he can't match what my God can do. I, I ain't, listen, I ain't, listen. I done, I done had uh, two heart valves that went bad. Uh, I done had a brain aneurysm. I, I done had a throat surgery. Um, I done had uh, 20, 25, maybe 30 uh, um, dialysis surgeries for placements for access. They ain't got nowhere else to put it. They have it in my leg now. They got nowhere else to put it. Nowhere else. They, I, both upper and lower arm. Both legs. Both sides of my chest. Even in my neck. There's nowhere else to go. So I got to get healed. Amen? Amen. It, it, it is, I'm, at, I'm at a point where healing is really the only option. Because they ain't, they ain't cutting, doing, they, listen. Ain't putting nothing else nowhere else. Amen? God has to heal me. Now, most people in my situation will seem, see, it's hopeless. I might as well just give up and just, you know, do dialysis for the rest of my life. No, not me. 
No, 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 no. I got too much to do, amen? And by the, I look too good to be on Dallas. I ain't got no business. Come on now. You can't look like this and be on Dallas. What, what is that? That ain't God. Then listen, I, I told myself several times, oh, you look good. Matter of fact, this morning, I was like, man, look here. They ain't ready for this. Don't let you, you listen, don't act like y'all ain't never said that to y'all seven in the mirror either. Some some of y'all walk past mirrors for no y'all do it. Okay. Y'all know how y'all do that walk. Y'all be like, mm-hmm. Constantly. Ain't nothing. Listen, you done, you done past five mirrors. Ain't nothing out of place. Everything was the way it looked in the last mirrors. Oh, look, God, we something else, Jesus. But you know what? That's the attitude we need to have. Yeah. That's the attitude of a fighter. That's the attitude of a person that has not given up, that person that has not uh, 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 said, God, your promises can't come to pass. They can come to pass. They shall come to pass. The condition is you need to stay in position. You need to stay in there. Do you know when you are, most bodybuilders will tell you this, when they're trying to get in a peak condition, especially if they're trying to compete for Mr. Olympia, that's the highest you can go. They are, their body can plateau. That means that you could be working out and see no improvement. You could be working out, doing everything you're supposed to do, and see no change. The muscle's not getting any more defined. The, your body's not looking any better. And you try to figure out what's wrong. What is wrong is your body needs to be shocked. You need to shock your muscles into change. That means, that in other words, what's going on is your muscles are telling you, I know what you're going to do. I know what kind of exercise you're going to do. I know what kind of intensity you have. So I'm prepared for it. So when you shock your muscle, you do something that the muscle was not looking for. And the muscle has to respond. What, 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 how does that make sense to us right now? That means that if what you're doing spiritually is not shocking your spiritual muscles, then you need to do something to shock it. That means you need to do something that's not normal, that's something that's not routine. That means you may need to go on a three-day water fast. Ain't nobody saying amen to that. You may have to uh, uh, come off social media for a month. I know, I know. Some of y'all looking at it. I don't know about that one. <laughs> you may have to leave those reality TV shows alone for about two, three months. You don't need to be watching Real Housewives or nothing. How you how you single watch your Real Housewives? How does that match? How can you identify with anything on that show? You single. Now, if it was real singles or something, then I can understand. But you watching real you you romanticizing and fantasizing about something that God can actually give you if you stay in position. They can't give it to you. And 90% of what you see on there ain't real anyhow. That is for the cameras and ratings. So you watching a fantasy world, hoping that a fantasy world can change your real world. No, no. Prayer and the word Amen. and walking the word and being in position changes your Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hallelujah. Go to Hebrews. We almost done. We are we, we almost done. And God had to, God had to teach me. God had to teach me this. When stuff goes wrong in your life, 
I, you know, own it. Own it. Everything ain't the other person's fault. It, it, my mama said this, it's only, it, it takes two to tango. Amen? So my divorce happened not simply because it was all my ex-wife's fault, because she wasn't married to herself. She was married to me. So I had a part to play in it. I had to own up to what I did wrong. I had to own up to what I wasn't and what I should have been. I had to own up to not being in the position as the priest like I should have been. Yeah, I was preaching and God was doing all this stuff, but that had nothing to do with the home life. See, my, 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 my public life should have matched my home life. But when your public life doesn't match your home life, there's going to be problems. Because it is your home life that gives your public life power. So I was a man of God in the pulpit, but I should have been the man of God in the bedroom. Oh, y'all ain't, okay. Y'all ain't ready for that. See, we want to be Christians where it's really not necessary. But where it's most necessary, we ain't. And that's where we need to be holy. Oh, that's where we need to be righteous. That's where God needs to be big in our life. Where it matters, not where it doesn't. See, this, what you said right here is a product of what I do in private. So when the, and the enemy is not going to be scared of you if what you do in private doesn't match what you do in public. You remember the story when they went to go cast the demon out of this, out of this man, and this man had legions in him. And when they went to go cast the demon out, the demon said, well, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you? That's a bad thing when a demon can say, who are you? That means he don't know you. That means you ain't made no impact. That means where is your prayer life? Where is your word life? Are you just quoting the word or do you walk it out? Can you recite a scripture or can you live a scripture? Demons ain't scared of you if you could just quote a scripture. They're frightened when you can live it. When you walk what you pray. When you walk what you read. That's when they get nervous around you. That's when stuff begins to change. And God wants a people that don't just quote a scripture, but can live a scripture. Because that's where the power comes from. That's where the change comes from. And that's where the ability to hold on to the promise comes from. Because you cannot hold on to God's promises in and of yourself. You, you, need, you need his spirit. His, his Holy Spirit is the one that gives you the power to hold on to the promise. Because what we deal with in the world it's so strong and so heavy that if God is not in control of your life, you will get sidetracked and go way off the rails. And before you know it, you was right here in the front seat. Next Sunday, you will even see you. And you know what begins to happen? Oh, I had, I had to work. Ain't nobody had to work that much. I'm working a lot of overtime. Okay, I understand you're working overtime. But who gave, you the, who gave you the job to get the overtime? Who gave you the ability to go to that job to work the overtime? He's the one that you should be uh, running to see. Not the job. Somebody say amen. amen. I told my son this the other day. I said, you cannot, I said, the person you need to please the most is Jesus. Everybody else comes second. Me, your mother, the church, everybody comes second to him. You please him first. You make what he wants important. And when you please him first and you keep him first, then God can do everything else. Everybody else will come second. And, and listen, if you try to please him first, the people who love him will be all right with that. The people who don't love them won't be. And now you know where to make the division at. 
But you don't live on this planet to please people. You live on this planet to please Christ. You please him first. Everybody else comes second. And some of us need to do some inventory in our lives. Some of us have put people in the wrong place. Some of us have put things in the wrong place. That have taken our, our eyes and our heart away from Christ. And caused us to put, put the importance on, on temporal things instead of eternal things. And then we wonder, well, God, where, where, where's, where's your power? God, where, where's your rescue? God, where, where, where's the strength to, to, to overcome this? God, where, where, where's the strength to see, my, see, see myself through this? God said, my strength is in my presence, where you have not been in a while. Can we be honest in here? So I, I, listen, I ain't trying to beat you over the head, but I ain't come to pat you on the back either. I would do you a great disservice to make this seem a little lighter than it needs to be. The devil will chew you up and spit you out. He cares nothing about you. And the fastest, fastest he can use you up and spit you out, the better. And he will use whomever he needs to use to get to you. He don't know, he, he don't play fair. He, there's no rules by what he does. The dirtier, the better. That's the type of devil we deal with. Amen? Look at this. Hebrews chapter 6. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Somebody said, God made me a promise. God made me a promise. Let me tell you, now I'm about to show you why. God's promises are so important and why they need to be so important in your life. Why you need to be God, yeah, your promise. Your, you, you need to be quoting God's promises left, right, and center. And why you need to base your life, your everything on God's promises. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. We have it, say, I got it. It says, when God made a promise to Abraham... He backed it all the way, not halfway, all the way, putting his own reputation on the line. He said, I promise that I will I'll bless you with everything I have. Bless and bless and bless. I like this verse. Abraham stuck it out. Now look, 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 what after God spoke, what did Abraham do? He stuck it out. After God promised, what did Abraham do? I need everybody's voice. When God promised, what did Abraham do? He stuck it out. That means he went through whatever he needed to go through. Abraham stuck it out and got everything that had been promised to him. See, that's what happens when you stick, stick it out. You get everything. When you go through whatever you need to go through. As hard as it is, as rough as it is, as terrible as it is, you go through it. You know how you can get through it? God's grace. God gives you grace to go through it. God gives you the grace to go through the trial. He doesn't, he doesn't go through the trial for you. He gives you the grace to go through it. See, this, listen. What unlocks the blessings of God in our lives is our actions. What we do. God is not going to pray for you. God is not going to believe for you. God is not going to fast for you. He's not going to give for you. You got to do that. We got to stop looking for God to do stuff that he left for us to do. Somebody say amen. He ain't going to do it for you. You got to do it. That means that God, God says, here's the promise. This is how you get it. Now get to it. Then you got to do the work. To get the results. Amen? You're not going to, you're, you're not going to build a million dollar corporation and you could and you, you you get out of bed at 12 o'clock. And then when you get out of bed, you just look any old kind of way. No, it don't work like that. 
He stuck it out and got everything that had been promised to him. When people make a promise, they guarantee them by appeal to something, some authority above, above them so that if anything, any questions that they may have, let me read that, appeal to some, some authority above them so that if there is any questions, that they'll make a good on the promise. The authority will back them up. When God wanted to guarantee his promises, he gave his word, a rock-solid guarantee. God can't break his word. And because his word cannot change, his promises, likewise, cannot change. I'm going to go King James on you. It says, when he can find no greater, he swore by himself. That means when God uttered a promise out of his mouth, because he couldn't find anyone greater than him to see that promise through, he looked back at himself and said, you got to do it. So he spoke the word, went in front of the word, verified the word with himself, and guaranteed it. So if God is unchangeable, that means his promises are unchangeable. That means no matter what the devil throws at you, what he shows you, what you go through, what you cry about, God's promises cannot change. I don't care what's going on. I don't care what's happening. God's promises are rock solid eternal. And there's nothing that can change them. And the only thing that can keep them from operating in your life is you. So that means if you are lining up with the word, that means if you are in position, that means that the promises are going to work. And here's another thing about the promises. They don't always work when you want them to. They work on God's time, not ours. We have our own crazy time frame. We want stuff to happen right now. No, you don't want stuff right now because you ain't ready for it right now. You may think you're ready for it right now, but you ain't. Because how you behave now is indicative of how you would behave then. So if you have bad behavior now, do you really want bad behavior with the blessing? I don't think you do. Do you want to keep the blessing when you get it? I'm pretty sure you do. So you, got the, so you have to have God line you up with the promise, with his word. God, fix my attitude. God, fix my, 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 my mind frame. God, fix what I see. God, fix my wants. God, fix my desires. God, I got some bad desires. I got some unholy desires. God, I desire stuff. I ain't got no, God, you got to take this. Woo, God, you got to take this one. This thing wakes me up in the middle of the night. I be thinking about this stuff at 3 o'clock in the morning. I ain't got no business thinking about this. God, you got to take this out of, okay. Somebody say amen. You don't want no, mm-hmm. Hallelujah. do you. You know, there's a scripture that says, delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, most of us misread that scripture. We misread it. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you can find that, Pastor Ploma. But we mo most of us read this and understand this, that if we delight ourselves in God, then God will give us the desires we have in our heart. That is not what that means. We misquote and misunderstand that. What it re what's really going on here, the Bible says, if we would delight ourselves in the Lord, that he will give us the desires of our heart, meaning that he will put desires that he has there. He won't get us what we already have. You don't want that. You want what he has. So as you delight yourself in him, as you make him everything, as you fall in love with him, then he changes those unholy desires in your heart and gives you his hope. And now you have good desires. But you have to delight yourself in him. 
What does that look like to lighten yourself in him? That means nobody has to twist your arm to come to church. Nobody has to threaten you. Some, something that's, nothing has to go wrong for you to show up at the altar praying. You at the altar praying just because you love him, you want to meet with him. He just built, I just got to see. You ever, you ever, you know how you was when you met that person? And you just wanted to be with them all the time? And you was thinking about them, and you texting them, and you calling them, and all kind of stuff. You don't roll, you don't, you don't change your, 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 the thing on your phone, your screensaver. You don't change it to they face. <laughs> you don't change their name in the phone from, you know what, to a little, little uh, uh, cute name and some lovey name. And, you know, you know how, come on now. Don't, don't leave your boy out here. I know I am not alone. In that. See, you know that feeling you got when you first you first met them and you just got butterflies and every time you was around them, you just felt like you just 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 uncoordinated and just didn't Lord, what is wrong with me? See, that's how you need to get with Jesus. That's how I need to be with him. That every time you around him, what is wrong? I don't I can't even act right. You just get all dign undignified and everything. You just you know how you all together, brothers, you know how you be all cool? You know what I'm saying? How you doing? You okay today? You know, you know how we brothers. Holla at your boy. Am I right? You know that's how we do. But you get around that one girl and your voice all cracking. It may go up an octave. You act, you walk, you can't, not, you can't do nothing right. You just got just, just butterflies and everything. That's how that need to be with Jesus. You need to be so in love with him that when you're around him, you can't even act right. That nothing else matters but him. That he, in that instance, becomes your whole world. That's how that need to be with him. That's what delighting yourself in the Lord looks like. And when you delight yourself in him, then he will give you the desires of your heart. Let's finish this. Amen? Hebrews chapter 6. Oh, we read that. I just want to read again, but I'm not. This, this, look at this promise God gave us. Go to Deuteronomy 28. I want you to look at it. I'm going to read through it. I ain't on, I ain't on expound, but I'm just going to read through it. Amen? Because even I can smell the food from back there. Deuteronomy 28. Starting in verse 2, it says, And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou hearken unto the voice of the Lord, thy Lord. Blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, that means your children, and the fruit of thy ground, that means what you do for, for work, and the fruit of thy cattle. That means the stuff that you do as a career that brings in revenue. It says blessed. And the increase of thy kin and the flocks of thy sheep. That means when you delight yourself in God, God don't bless everybody connected with you. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Mm -mm. Yeah, that means, listen, everybody paying full price for stuff, you pay half price. Amen. Well, how you get that for a high price? Don't worry about that. It's who I know. Well, who you know? I can, I can introduce you to him. Blessed shall thou be when thou comes in, and blessed shall thou be when thou go out. So that's one promise. That means God is going to not just bless you, Bless who you connected to. Bless what you do for a living. Bless your career. Bless what your career produces for you. That means when other people get paid, you will get paid double. And they try to figure out why they pay you more. Quinn gave a testimony not long ago. No, it, it, it was Quinn, but it was Sharika too. Sharika created her own position. How you work... <laughs> I've I I still been trying to figure this one out. 
how you go on the job and you just say, well, I, I want, I'm going to be this. And they say, okay. And then give you what you want for that position. That's Deuteronomy 28. She live, they live in what I do. Queen, your money, your, your job stay trying to give you something, don't it? And stay trying to get her something. Say, here, take this too. You want some more money? Hey, take some more money. That's what happens. That's the promise. That's what the enemy is trying to fight. That's just why he's, that's what he's trying to get you not to see. That this is what happens. This is what the promise looks like. Somebody say amen. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Twelve and twelve and nine. I'll I, I, I read it for you. But he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast in all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship. And persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He says, I'm going to boast in all. I'm, look, look, what they say. It says, in weakness, in insults, in hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. That's what I was experiencing in 113 degree weather sitting up in that truck. I, I, I was weak. I was insulted. It was hard. All kind of difficulties. And trust me, it was not a good. I, that's why I think Joey Friday night. I think it was, yeah, it was Friday. Wasn't it? It was Tuesday. One of them nights. It was Tuesday? Thank you. Joey came out there, him and Mother Diana came out there. And, and my son, it helped me. I was very grateful. Uh, yes, I was. I ain't got, you see how dark I am? I ain't got no business in the sun like that. <laughs> None. None. Uh, you okay. All right. When I came to Florida, I was my son's complexion. <laughs> I'm not lying. <laughs> see what the sun can do? Sun ain't good. Being in the sun is like being in sin. Okay, you think I'm, all right. You think I'm joking. I ain't, I'm, I, listen. Yes, I'm going to do that. What is, what is God saying to us today? What is God saying to us today? That you will face some, in, some problems you will face will make you want to leave this world. It will make you want to just quit on life. It will make you want to give up. And some of them problems come one after the other after the to the point where you say, God, I can't, I can't. It's like, it's like drowning in the ocean. It's like the wave hitting you after wave after wave. You can't even catch your breath to be able to swim or do anything because the water just keeps coming. And you feel like this is hopeless. And listen, hopelessness, the enemy throws that at us like you, that's one of the major weapons he uses against us. It's hopelessness. And harder, the harder the situation, the more hopelessness he likes to throw at us. But what we have to understand is that if Christ is our Lord, as hard as it is, he is there in the hardest with us. He has not left us alone. He has not abandoned us. He's not left us our own devices. He is right there. We just have to remember that our God is there. He didn't leave. He's not that type of God to bring you and then drop you and leave you high and dry. People will leave you high and dry all the time. God is not like that. God will never do that. God has never done, in 32 years, God has never left me high and dry. I faced some hardships. I faced some bad moments. I faced some moments where I was actually dying. 
And there's some moments when I wanted to die. There's times when I, you wouldn't believe this, there were times I thought of trying to end it. What, if I, what would happen if I just died on a machine? What if I just put to sleep and then wake up? Yes, it was a thought, you know, what would my son do? You know, what, you know, what, what people that love me, what, what would, but the problems had gotten so big and so bad that I didn't want to be in this world with those problems no more. And it gets like that. But Christ is there. He never left. We don't, we don't take that poem to heart as we should anymore. Of footsteps. We were saying, God, when, you know, when stuff was the worst, it was only one footstep. It was one, one track of foot, footsteps. And God, what, what happened? Why did you leave me? God says, I didn't leave you. I was carrying you. So when it got the hardest, I picked you up out of what you were going through and carried you through it. So you wouldn't have to face it alone because I know you couldn't, but I could. So I'm taking the brunt for you. I'm taking the weight for you. I'm carrying you through this because you trust me when there was no reason to trust me. When there's nothing around you that said trust God and you trust me anyway. When people told you to leave and you stayed. When people told you to give up and you stayed in there. When people said stop giving tithes and stuff and you can't pay your bills. You said, God, I'm going to honor you with my substance. I made an agreement. I'm going to honor you. And God, you said if I honor you, you will honor me. And there's not been a time when I've been homeless. There's not been a time when I've been hungry. There's not been a time when I've been without. God, you always come in the nick of time. God, you blessed me the times I didn't ask you to bless me. You came through, God, when I wasn't even praying for a blessing. And God, you showed up. So God, why would I leave you? And God says, if you believe, that I'm that type of God, then you will stick it out like Abraham did. I'm going to make a call right now. Everybody bow your head. Chad, come on. And this is not a call that you just come, just, just to come. This is a point of no return call. What do I mean by that? When you come, you're not going back the same. You have made up in your mind, God, I'm going to focus on your promise more than my problem. I'm not going to let my problem distract me anymore. You've been too good for me to do that. If you want to show, you want to make a statement that your promise is greater than your problems, I want you to come to this altar. You're telling God, you're telling heaven, you're telling hell, you're telling everybody, my promise is greater than my problem. And I am no longer going to allow my problem to dictate my movement, to dictate my behavior. God, we bless you. We glorify you. We magnify your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, you're wonderful, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is none like you. No one else can touch 
my heart like you do. And I can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Yes, God. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. God, we thank you, Father. God, we magnify your name. God, the worship team sung your man of your word. You are a God of your word. God, we are standing up for you today. So, God, you will stand up for us. God, we thank you for the grace to go through the trial. God, we thank you for the grace to go through the difficulty. God, we thank you for the grace to go through the hardship. God, we thank you for the ability to smile when there's nothing to smile about. God, the ability to sing when there's nothing to sing about. God, in the worst possible moments, God, we're giving you the praise. God, we're giving you the honor. God, we're trusting you. That spirit of giving up, I cast it out right now. The spirit of hopelessness, I cast it out right now. That spirit of suicide, I cast it out right now. God, I curse it at its root. God, everybody that's been feeling hopeless and been feeling down, God, and God, how I'm going to make it, God. God, they don't understand how hard it is. God, I come in with a smile, God, but I'm crying inside. God, they can't understand the pain that I'm feeling. God, you understand. God, you said you would get beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. God, you will give us that singing, God, the spirit of heaviness, God. We, Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus, God. That, God, we're able to praise you no matter what. God, we're able to glorify you no matter what. If that's you, you need to let that go. Let, let that go. God knows what's going on. God understands what's going on. God had not left you by yourself. You are not alone. You are not alone. People may not see, but God sees. People may not know, but God knows. And not only does God know, not only does God see, God will do something about it. But God says, I need you to hold on to me. Hold on to my word. Hold on to my promise. You read my promises are unchangeable. If I'm unchangeable, my promises are unchangeable. God says, that means I didn't change my mind. 
What I intend to do with you, I will do with you. Yeah, let him do that. 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 Just let that go. Let that unburden that. The Bible says he's our burden bearer. That burden wasn't made for you, it was made for him. The Bible says for him for us to cast our cares upon him. That literally means to take our cares off like a jacket and put it on him. Mother God sees your pain. He sees your burden. He sees your heartache. He sees everything. God says, I understand and I know and I'm here. God says, I understand, I know, and I'm here. Even as I'm, even as right now, you can feel his arms wrapping around you. Young man, every, listen, God knows. God knows how hard it is. He knows how hard it is to stay right, to keep yourself, to not fall in with everybody, not to give in to the, 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 the test and the trials and the struggle and the thing that's pulling you. God says, my strength is made perfect at weakness. Young man, if you would reach for him, God says, I'll see you through it. I'll strengthen you through it. I won't let you go under. No matter what you are going through, any person at this altar, God says, I got you. I'm a big enough God that I got you. Your problem is not too heavy for me. It's not too much for me. Your situation is not too complicated for me. There's nothing I can't handle. There's nothing I can't pull you through. There's nothing I can't raise you above. God says, my strength is strong enough to see you through. God says tomorrow will be a different day because you will be a different person. God says, God says the viewpoint, the perspective you took in today, you won't take into tomorrow. How you see things today will not be how you see things tomorrow. God says if you trust me, I will change it all. God says, if you hold on to my word, I will change it all. And I will strengthen you through the process. God says, and when you go through, you will come out and not smell like smoke. For God says, you will never end it by yourself to begin with. The Lord says, when you gave your life to me, I signed on to be with you no matter what. In the good, the bad, and the ugly. The ups and the downs. The God, God says, the reason you didn't lose your mind was because I was holding it. The reason stuff didn't fall apart, God says, I was holding your life together. It was me that was doing it. It was me that was doing it. It was me. It was me that kept you from ending it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
The devil wanted you to believe that it was hopeless. He wanted you to believe. Patrice, that's why, that's why God brought you. Today's word was you. It was you. You was here on your last toe. Your last toe. God, if you don't, God, if you don't do something now, that's it. God, I'm, they don't even understand. I'm barely holding on. I'm beyond barely holding on. I can't do it anymore. I give up. God, you got to, add, God, you, God, I, you got to add something. God, help. God says, Patrice, I never left you. I was there the whole time. And me bringing you here today and giving you those roses would signal that I'm, I am here. I was listening. I heard you. Pastor Ellie, if you can, put your hand on her heart. What the enemy sought to damage beyond repair, God says, I'm healing it now. God says, I'm mending the broken pieces. He hit your heart with some stuff that should have taken your life. But I said no. I said no. And the Lord says, when I say no, that's what it is. And every hardship you've ever had in life can be traced back to your heart. That's why he wanted to kill you. If he, he wanted to kill you, he wanted to kill your boys, he wanted, he wanted to end it all. He wanted to see, he wanted you to be so hopeless. But God says, I turned that around today. Yeah. 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 And the Lord says, the, hopeless you, the hopelessness that you felt, you will feel no longer. God says, as a matter of fact, you might as well change your name to hope. God, God says, right now, I'm putting a hope in you that defies logic. That defies reason. That defies circumstances. That defies situations. God says, the hope I'm, it's a supernatural hope that I'm putting in you. And God says, I'm going, I'm going to give you the peace. That's the past soul understanding. God says, tonight, you will know a peace like you've never known. God says, you will know a peace that you've dreamed of, you prayed for, that you thought you would never have. God says, I'm going to, I'm going to shower it on you. At least for the next seven days, you're going to feel a peace that you can't even describe to people. Now the Lord says, Patrice, you can't leave me. Because if you leave me, death is certain. You can't even move away from me. You can't even step to the side. God says you have to be attached to my hip.
God says, you, when I give instructions, you got to follow it to the letter. God says, when you do that, the blessings that will explode in your life will be unimaginable. God says, I didn't bring you here for nothing. I brought you here to restore. Because this is where you got your first blessing. Yeah. This is the house that I used to bring you out the first time. And God says, this will be the house that I used to bring you out now. Mm. I need everyone to hear me and hear me clearly. The primary reason for God bringing you into this church, into this body of believers, into this assembly, under this shepherd, under these shepherds, is to restore you to his original intent and to pull you out of what the devil's trying to get you into. The greatness that God wants to in unlock in your life will be unlocked here. God says the combination to your lock is in this house. And when God brings you to a house like this, you can't leave when you want to. You can't decide I'm, I'm healthy enough or I'm good enough, or I've got it enough to go ahead. God says, I'm attached to you, so that means you're attached to me. God says, I, if I brought you here, I want you, I brought you here to heal you, to restore you, to use you. Your talent does not mean that I'm with you. You can get stuff from your talent. That don't mean I'm with you. But there are certain things that cannot happen without me being with you. The consistency, the longevity of your blessings, or attached to the house in which you got them. That means God moves through this house through you. God speaks through these servants to speak into you. God uses this man and woman of God to mold you into his image and his likeness. And the enemy will try, and he will come subtly it won't even look like he's coming. That's why you have to have eyes to see. That's why you cannot get sidetracked. Because you are dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. And he knows you are. So he will do whatever he can to get you out of position. To destroy you. But the Lord says... If you would heed his word and commit yourself to his kingdom and honor his kingdom and listen to his man and woman servant, God says, the blessings that I would unlock in your life, no amount of talent could have ever given it to you. God says, I will put a grace on your life that the enemy will not be able to take you out. But the condition is, you have to listen to his servants. God put that man and woman of God on this planet, in this house, in this country, 
for you. God said, I designed them for you. I designed the word, the anointing I placed on their life with you in mind. God says, if you heed, God says, then I will bless. Somebody say amen to that. I am not, a, I say this a lot. But not only am I not alive, not, I'm not functioning, I'm not doing nothing if it wasn't for this house. Yes, we are the church. But God designed this house to keep me alive. When the, enemies, when the devil sought to kill me, he used this house to keep me alive. And because I'm in this house, I was privileged enough to be in position to preach this word. So this word doesn't come from me without this house. Now, if God can do that through me, what can God do, do through you? What is God waiting to do through you because of this house? If you think that's unbiblical, I'm going to give you Bible for it. Moses told the children of Israel, if you're on the Lord's side, come to me. If you're not, you stay over there. And those that went next to Moses were saved. Those that didn't were swallowed up. So you think I'm just promoting a man and a woman? There's Bible behind what I'm saying. God brings you here to heal you, to restore you, to use you. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Do not get robbed. This is not the time to do that. This is not the season to do that. The stuff God is about to have us walk into is going to blow people's minds. We, we can't even, we can't comprehend the stuff God is about to allow this ministry to walk through. He says, eyes have not seen, neither is heard. Neither has it entered to the heart of man that I have prepared for you. Well, you could take that to Jump Ministries Global Church. Eyes have not seen. Neither ears heard, neither has it entered to the heart of man what he has prepared for us. And if you are on this boat, grab on to whatever you can grab on to. Because the seas may get rough, but as long as you don't get thrown overboard, you good. Somebody say amen. amen. So if you commit yourself to hold on to the boat, I want you to put your hands together and give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah.